So uh, this video has actually been a long time coming uh, ish. It actually got filmed several weeks ago, but I was not able to get it on the schedule where I wanted it on the schedule because we had to move some things around for a number of reasons. One, obviously the Sierra candles, you know, testing and all the things. And two, you know, the stuff with the lush deep, whatever. Anyway, we had to move the schedule around. We had to do some creative things. And as a result, you are getting this video later than expected, but I know that it's been highly anticipated. So I'm gonna send you the intro. We're gonna talk more about it in just a minute. But before I do, hello, I am Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things, and you are here for day 314 of 365 days of soap. And today, we are finishing the Melt and Pour Clear Melt and Pour from Scratch series and giving you my recipe. And we are also going to talk about so many of the questions that I got in the, you know, videos that we've done previously. Like, Talking about just using like pure ethanol or um, what if I can't find Everclear or all the things. And so that's what we're going to chit chat about. We are also going to talk about a book that I love quite a bit that has loads of uh, mountain pour recipes from scratch in them. And uh, also at the end of all this, we're going to be doing tests of all of the mountain pour glycerin clear soap bases that I've made from scratch against each other and also trying some bluing techniques to see if you can make your maybe a little bit yellow mountain pour maybe a little bit clear. So let's get to the video. That's actually a crap ton to cover and it's going to be one of the longer ones that I've been doing of late. So, you know, we should get to it. Okay, so today is my preferred method of making a clear mountain pour soap. And I have more time today to actually talk about the whys of melt and pour soap. So that's what we will be doing. First up, the recipe will be coming shortly, but it's not here yet. And this is all a process that you're familiar with because we've done the other two videos. Second up, I do actually change the method a little bit in here, but I will probably be talking about something else when it does happen. So I'm just going to give you a heads up. When you see me put two clear things in a you know, container, that's the glycerin and that's the alcohol. And then I cover that in saran wrap and then I put it on a heat pad and put another heat pad on top and then, you know, all the things and heat up my alcohol solution. I heat up my solvents before moving on. So just when you see that happening, that's what's going on. Now, also what I am doing in all of this is I am making a soap paste. So to answer the questions that ha have been coming up about whether or not you can make mountain pour soap out of a soap paste, the answer is yes, you absolutely can, because that's how this particular method starts. I am making a soap paste. And so that question answered. Here's the part that I was telling you about. That's the glycerin and the alcohol that I will mix into this and then heat up that solution, heat up my solvents. So there's that. Now, when you are making something from a soap paste that you've already created, like a bulk soap paste recipe, the only thing that you do want to keep in mind if you're looking for clarity is going to be the oils that you used to make the soap paste in the first place. So if you have olive oil 
or a jojoba or something that's avocado, rice bran, oils that are dark in nature, you are likely not going to get the transparency that you're looking for if you're looking for a super crystal clear soap. You can make a, an opaque melton pour, no problem whatsoever with a soap paste that has the darker oils in it. But if you're looking for crystal clear from soap paste, make sure you pay attention to that. Now, I have said, while we have been doing these, you know, things with the melt and pour recipes from scratch, it's all about the solvents, baby. And it is all about the solvents, baby. But we really haven't had enough time to super talk about why the solvents are necessary and why we do what we do in melt and pour soap making, especially when it comes to transparent soaps. So let's talk about the solvents while I make said soap paste. Now, first and foremost, your solvent that is going to provide your clarity. Well, technically speaking, they both work in concert to provide your clarity, but more on that later. But the big one for clarity is going to be your alcohol. And I use ethanol because that's the best thing to use for clarity. Now, I get a lot of questions about where to find ethanol because I have told you get Everclear. And a lot of people have said, no, I can't buy Everclear in my state. It's against the law. And okay, fair point. That, that makes all the sense in the world. You can go online and find ethanol from a chemical supply store, right? But not all ethanols are created equal. For example, if you go to the Home Depot and you pick up like their denatured alcohol, which suggests it's ethanol. It's not, it has other ingredients in it that are not going to be good for soap making. So what you really want to keep in mind when you are shopping for your chemicals online is that it's, you know, a pure grade ethanol and even better if it says it's meant for, you know, cosmetic use and then you're good to go. An example of a website that you can get, you know, pure ethanol from for soap making is simplesolvents.com. You can also get it at carolina.com. And there's, so there's your alternative to Everclear. I will post both of those in the description. No worries there. Second question I get is why not just the highest percentage of isopropyl alcohol I can find? Good question as well. Uh, the, you can use isopropyl alcohol as a substitution for ethanol, but by nature of what isopropyl alcohol is, A, it will never be as strong as, as ethanol. Two, propyl alcohol is a completely different beast. I mean, it comes from propylene, which is a product, an off gas of the refinement of petroleum. It has one extra carbon in the chain than ethanol, and it has a molar mass that is significantly higher than ethanol. All of these things combined with the fact that it's not ever going to be as potent of a solvent means that while you can get a clear-ish, you know, soap, it's never going to be completely crystal clear. So it is an option to substitute, but if you're going for completely crystal clear and a good bubble at that, it's not a great option. But you know, in a pinch, you can use it, just find the highest amount, highest percentage that you can. So there's that for the first solvent. Now let's go on to talk about the second solvent, the glycerin, which is also technically speaking an alcohol. Okay, so now glycerin as a, you know, another solvent in the solution. What do we know about glycerin? It's a humectant. It is emollient. It loves to, you know, be moisturizing and also contributes to the bubble. Also helps with the clarity. This is also me putting in the solvents after we have cooked this soap paste to oblivion. But the most important reason that you include glycerin into a melt and pour, a remeltable soap, is because when in concert with the alcohol that you're putting in, the ethanol, it is a perfect solution to disrupt the crystallization in a soap, which is what allows you to remelt it in the first place. We will talk more about the crystallization in soap in a little bit after the recipe drops because that is a whole different can of worms and I am going to open it today because why not? funsies. Let's finish up with solvents first. The third and final solvent in a clear melt and pour soap recipe is your sugar solution. So your sugar water. And everybody varies on how much sugar they actually put into their, their, their solution. 
for me, I well, you're going to get the recipe in just about a minute or so. But I love using sugar in this because, and kind of copious amounts of sugar. 30 minute cook, that's what we've done so far, by the way. Sorry. Anyway, I love using a sugar solution in rather copious amounts because it contributes to the lather, which is very, very good. But it also provides that extra bit of clarity that you're really looking for in a clear melt and pour soap. So those three solvents used in consort, right? So your ethanol and your glycerin and your sugar water, that's going to be the trifecta to achieve a clear remeltable soap. Now, if you are just going for an opaque soap, you don't need to worry about clarity as much, right? So the sugar water, not really necessary. Uh, glycerin, technically speaking, in all melt and pour soap recipes, it's not necessary, but it is the easiest ingredient to incorporate into a melt and pour soap recipe to ensure that you're going to get the remeltability with this. And so that's obviously a very, very good thing. We're not talking about um, opaque melt and pour. I know that I've just given one recipe on the channel thus far for a, you know, a white melt and pour. If you guys want another one, let me know if you want more information on that and how the solvents get adjusted. That's cool. And we can do that. Just let me know. That would be excellent. But what I have done here in this instance right now is I have again added the solvents and I am mixy mixy. So I've added the alcohol and the glycerin doing the mixy mixy thing to ensure that all of the soap paste is dissolved into the solvents and then is going to sit at heat for another 30 minutes. That, that's the thing. This is kind of an arduous one. Now on to the recipe. Okay. 0% super fat, 25% water by oil weight, same coconut and stearic that we've used before, but the water is at a pretty steep discount right now. We have a uh, one part lye to 1.4 parts water. The solutions have remained the same for this as the previous two recipes I've given you, but I'm decreasing the water amount and I always do as well as the super fat down to 0% because we don't really want any free flowing oils in a clear soap. So 0% for sure. Now, a lot of people get scared at that, you know, lie to water ratio there, but just remember you only ever need as much water as you have lye in a solution and decreasing this water for this for me is we already are adding so much liquid. You actually think about the amount of actual soap that's in this. It's not a lot. It's mostly just a whole lot of liquid and a whole lot of water from that sugar solution. So I can totally cut down my, uh, you know, actual water with the lye. So we don't have like a rubbery soap at the end of all of it. Now, what I'm doing here is after I have let the solvents, the ethanol and the glycerin sit in the soap and cook for about 30 minutes on low. I keep it on low. Everything's always around 170 to 180 degrees during this entire process. I then have added the sugar solution, which I have strained and measured out to have the right amount. And I'm going to mix it in. And then I'm going to pour it into a mold. Also, you can use isopropyl alcohol here to get rid of some bubbles, but that's, you know, cool. What is happening here? Oh, right. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. So I like to let it sit for around 10 minutes to see if it's forming a film. And if it is, that tells me that it's been mixed enough and it is time to pour it. So that's what is going on here. I am pouring it. I will then set it and forget it. And that will be the thing. Now, since we do have time at the end of all of this to not only test the lather and also some bluing techniques, we are going to do that, but I am going to talk about why these solvents work and why that's because crystallization. So, you know, let's get to that. Yeah. Okay, and on to the reveal and all the things, and don't be, you know, fooled by the yellowing. It's weird lighting, and it's also, you know, thick when you cut whatever. Anyway. So we are going to blue things for fun with all of the different solutions that we have done and the different mountain pours that we have made throughout all of this just for funsies. But while we're doing that, I again want to get back to the big point. Why do the solvents work? Well, 
The solvents work to, in this case, form not only a remeltable soap, but also a soap that is transparent because they disrupt the crystallization process in soap. And we've all heard crystallization, right? Yeah, me too. Cool. So what does that mean? Well, soap in and of itself passes through a colloidal system. Now, what does that mean? Well, you have a heterogeneous mixture in this, right? You have oil and you have water. They don't mix. You can pour oil into water and what happens? They form two separate layers. So what do we do in order to make them mix? We have to find a way to get them into a solution that will not fall out into the two separate layers. And in doing that, we use lye to disrupt it and mechanical intervention with the mixy mix, which actually goes to one phase of the colloidal dispersion, right? And that is the dispersed phase, which essentially means all tiny particles of, you know, the oils and tiny particles of the water are existing out there pretty much dispersed kind of evenly. And then we have to keep them that way. And we keep them that way by, you know, adding the lye certainly, but with that, is the crystallization because as they are kept in this dispersed phase the crystallization forms and that's how it yields a solid bar of soap and so with this while the crystallization is still happening in a you know glycerin soap they're not as long and dense when crystallization occurs they become very long thick structures that you can't see through anymore. Now the solutions, the solvents actually help keep those further apart and thinner. So while the crystallization is still occurring, it's not so thick and dense that you can't see through it. And that's also why you can remelt it because again, while the crystallization has occurred, it has been thinned out essentially. So it's easier to in fact do that unlike with cold process or hot process or regular whatever without solvents that are kind of disrupting that and forcing them further apart you can't melt you know cold process or hot process soap 24 hours after pouring it you can't just pop in the microwave remelt it and get this why because 70 percent of the crystallization has already occurred during the saponification process so you know to that if you're ever wondering why cure time is absolute garbage and the actual answer to that how long is cure is actually when it stops losing weight that's why the majority of the crystallization occurs during saponification in most cases there are exceptions to the rule but this is definitely the rule because science and so you know whenever you've ever heard anyone saying oh cure time is four to six weeks no matter what because crystallization no that's not accurate and I swear if I hear one more person misquote Kevin Dunn on the subject, I will, you know, lose my mind up in here, up in here. It's not the crystallization, it's still the water weight. And to that, does this need a cure? Same answer that I give all the time. A cure is not a thing that's a weird, you know, whatever. But to, yeah, it's still going to lose some weight. The sugar water, this is going to evaporate, as will some of the glycerin in this. So yeah, maybe two weeks-ish, but same concept. When it stops losing weight, it's good to go. It's, you know, it's completely fine and it's not going to change. So there's that. And also to that, I, couple things. I have another method of doing, you know, melt and pour glycerin soaps from scratch that is a more advanced method in that it is involving putting the alcohol in with a lye solution right away, which can be scary, and why I have not done it for any of these soaps. It is my preferred method to use if I am making clear soaps that I want to use like just as their own, like in bar form. This method is great for all of my embeds and all the other things that I use, you know, soap for, glycerin soap for. But if you're interested in seeing that process and a recipe for that, I am happy to do that too. But honestly, if you are interested in just making transparent melt and pour glycerin soaps, just in general, like you really want a really good deep dive on it, I recommend picking up a book that is a very old book at this point, but it is the best book out there as far as you know making transparent soap goes. It's the hows, the whys, all of the jazz. And it is by Catherine Faylor, F-A-I-L-O-R, 
called Making Transparent Soap. And it's a great, great book reference point if you really want to get into how this all works, why it works, how to troubleshoot and change things. And it's honestly where I started when I started making, you know, remeltable soaps. I took all of the information from there, combined it with my chemistry knowledge, and then just started playing until I found a recipe that really worked well for me. The purple didn't work. I saw a thing on TikTok that said if it's yellow, you add purple bleach to hair. And I was like, well, maybe, maybe that'll work. That was for the peppermint soap, which was already going to be a disaster anyway. But yes, so there they all are in their different glories, all three of the different types of soap that we have made throughout this melt and pour clear glycerin soap journey thing. There they are. And as I showed you with these two, scant lather with the first two that I did not use ethanol for. And that's why, really. Ethanol is going to be the better option with this. But again, not using ethanol and using isopropyl, also completely fine if all you're doing with a clear, you know, soap is like embeds or whatever. Your performance is going to come from the cold process around it. So that's completely fine. But, you know, if you want the good bubble and the clarity and all the things, I highly recommend going ethanol for sure. And if you can't find Everclear, again, go to your chemical supply stores online and make sure, again, that there, ha there are codes, there are data, data pages. I will link what you should be looking for in the description. Holy crap, I'm linking so much stuff in this description. Hope I get it all in. But yeah, you can also get it online for sure. And again, in a pinch, sure, use isopropyl alcohol, but you're never gonna get the clarity or the big bubble that you're really looking for in a clear soap if your goal is completely clear, you know, with isopropyl. So there's that. And yeah, this has been a really fun, crazy journey with all of this. And I, again, highly recommend picking up Catherine Faylor's book. If you are interested in more of the kind of mini tangent I went off on as far as uh, cure time goes, I recommend picking up Kevin Dunn's book. And also I will link some of the, uh, the, 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 the studies that he's been involved in that again, talk about crystallization and what it is and why it does not mean you have to cure your soaps for four weeks or six weeks or whatever arbitrary timeline somebody sold you, you know, below as well. So this weirdly was a recipe day, but also ended up being kind of a weird mini deep dive. I'm sorry. I talked kind of fast in all of this. I hope it all came out. If not, we need an FAQ. Let me know. And there it is, a whole bunch of melt and pour, all made from scratch by yours truly. And uh, yeah, very cool. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if you are coloring your melt and pour, it is not necessary to get a crystal clear base. But if you want one, that's how you do it. So that's fun. Uh, if you are interested in the book that I mentioned, you should definitely go pick it up. As I said, it's an older book, but it's one of the most comprehensive on melt and pour from scratch recipes. And honestly, that's not something that you see a lot. You don't see a whole lot of recipe books on melt and pour bases. So definitely pick that one up. It's very good. I highly recommend it. All of the things. And uh, yeah, we will do some more melt and pour things in the next uh, little bit because there are actually a lot of ways to make a melt and pour. Uh, just not really a lot of ways to make a clear melt and pour. For the most part, as you can see with all of these recipes, you basically have the same needs as far as your solvents and whatnot go in order to make this a success. So, but as far as the, the other melt and pour, the one that's not clear, yeah, there's lots of other ways to do that. So we will test a few of those ways in, you know, the coming days, weeks, whatever, whenever I can get those on the schedule and that will be fun. I really appreciate you guys for joining me today. A special thank you to my Sudzers. As always, you guys are everything. You are why I am here. You are why I continue to do this. You are why I share recipes and do things that I don't have to do. I like you and I like interacting with you and answering any questions and helping out with anything that I can along the way. And uh, that's what the Sudzer community has become a big collective of makers and uh, scientific brains and logical, rational thinkers. And it's cool. So 
Thank you for being a part of that. I am going to take off, but I will see all of you guys again tomorrow for another round of Soapy Fun. What is tomorrow? Oh, tomorrow's an FAQ. That'll be fun. Yes. So I will see you guys all again, you know, tomorrow. Then. Okay. I messed up my outro. Bye. I have a pen.